Hi everyone, welcome back to my Barons War series. In this video, what I'd like to talk more about is retinue building. Retinue building is essentially how you build an army list. And this is what you need to do before you play any Barons War game, so you make sure you know exactly what you're playing with and exactly what your opponent's playing with. So the game rules keep this very simple. In essence, every army is made up of one of two different types. Either a commander who has the command ability or a warrior who is your normal bog standard grunt. There are a number of basic rules that apply when you're building a retinue. Every single retinue you build must have at least one commander. It doesn't matter whether that's a veteran sergeant, it doesn't matter whether it's a lord or a baron, you must include one commander. If, for some reason, you choose to include more than one commander, then you must designate one of those commanders to be your leader. When you're equipping your command group or groups, up to 50% of your total points can be spent on the command groups themselves. So if you were building a 500 point list, you could spend up to 250 points on command groups, whether that's one group or two. Aside from command groups, you have warrior groups. These are your normal troops. They could be, for example, things like spearmen. They could be bowmen. They could be sergeants. They could be knights. Each of these have a different experience level available, which we'll talk about soon, but you must spend at least 10% of your points on green troops. This means you have to spend 10% on rubbish, crappy troops. So if you build a 500 point list, you must spend at least 50 points on green troops. And that could either be spearmen, bowmen, that sort of thing. As I think I mentioned in my previous video, there are some limits on group sizes. The minimum size for an infantry group is three. So you must have at least, uh, not a good example there, you must have at least three models in an infantry group. For cavalry, the minimum is two models. There is no limit on the maximum number of troops you can have. So if you wanted, you can make a group of 20 spearmen. There are advantages and disadvantages to having big groups or small groups. Um, the average group size seems to be between four, five, or six potentially for cheaper units. Some retinues I've seen go up to about 10, but they don't tend to go anywhere beyond that. The final restriction, and I think I mentioned this previously, is all warriors within a group must be equipped with the same equipment. So for example here, I've got a veteran uh, sergeant with a axe and a veteran sergeant with a spear. You couldn't do that. You'd have to have one or the other equipped for them. Because of lack of models, I usually sort of like lump them all together and say, well, they have just got spears. And provided your opponent is aware of what you're using, and provided you've paid the appropriate points for it, I can't see anyone having an issue with that if you were playing the game. It must be said as well, the same applies for training levels. You cannot mix training levels. We'll discuss that a bit further um, later on, but if you've got a group of green troops, they must all be green troops. So let's put these back. And what we'll do now is we'll talk through what exactly a, a unit profile is and what makes up that profile. So as I go through, it's always worth referring to the rule manual if you've got it, as each of the different rule books contains examples of different unit types. So you can see knights, sergeants, crossbowmen, and it gives you a breakdown of what each of these statistics means. So page 20 of the rule book outlines what each of these mean. Very simple. You've got a movement. This is their movement distance in inches. You've got their attack value. This is what they must roll on a d10 
in order to successfully attack. Defense, this is what they must roll on the D10 to success, successfully defend. Morale, this is what they must roll on a D10 to successfully pass a morale check. Actions, this denotes how many times, how many actions they can take in a turn. There are ways to make units take more than one action, but we'll talk about that at a later time. And then points. This is essentially how many points it costs you to equip this unit into your retinue. We'll go into this in more detail at a later uh, point in the videos, but you'd also have any potential abilities. You would have equipment, options for other equipment, and then also you might have anything to do with sort of like any abilities, equipment, yeah, like I just said. There's also training level. The training level is very important statistics that we'll talk a bit more about now. When writing the rules, the guys started with a basic human profile and they've written a, a very interesting article on the Warhost blog page where they explain how they went about doing this. So they started with a basic human. That human has the same move, attack, defense, morale, and number of actions. That is standard regardless of whether it is a lord or a knight or a peasant. They have exactly the same base stat line. What changes that is several different things, such as their training, their equipment, and their abilities. As these things change, their attack, morale, or points, these all change. So this basically simulates the value of experience. So if, say, for example, you take a spearman. A green spearman would be the absolute bog standard that you could get. Essentially, he's a peasant who's been pulled out of the farm, given a stick, and told, go fight. He has a six-inch move, as do all other foot units. He has an eight-up attack. He's not very good with a spear. He can just about hold it the right way round. He has a seven-up defense because he has no armor. His morale is a six-up because, let's be honest, he'd rather be in the field. He's a one-action because he is just a normal warrior. He's very low on points. He has no abilities. And the only equipment that he has is his spear. If you were to take this down a step and look at the levy units, they wouldn't even get a spear. They basically have improvised weapons that give them no additional benefits. If you were to start looking at this spearman and say he was an irregular spearman, so potentially he's some sort of local militia, then his movement value still stays the same, but his attack goes up because he's got some basic training. His morale also goes up as well because he's a little bit more confident in using his weapon and in fighting. This continues if you were to go to a regular level or a veteran level. So by the time you get to a veteran spearman, this is someone who's been in a few battles before, been in a few campaigns, his movement is still the same, but his attack and his morale are better. He also then benefits from the brace ability. So as you can see, like, the more you spend on upgrading the training levels of your troops, the better they become. If you start to add things like armor, then it starts to affect other abilities. So if you were to add armor to this guy, it would take his move speed down by one inch. So that's basically to simulate the fact he's encumbered by having to wear armor. The same if you were talking about a knight. If you were to give a knight male, they lose two inches off their movement speed. So they actually become quite slow. These guys would move one inch because they've got leather or padded armor on. That does, however, give them a bonus to their defense. So the spearman would go from being a 7-up on his defence to being a 6-up. So, like I said, these benefits differ depending on whether it's male or whether it's padded armour. So it just basically simulates the fact that the knights have got access to better equipment. You can give units shields. These do not impact the defense statistic. The defense statistic would say the same. So if this guy had padded armor, he would still be a um, six up for defense. What a shield does do, though, is it comes in three different sizes. So you've got small, medium, and large. They give you an additional roll if you're trying to save a, um, save a wound. So you would essentially you'd roll your first defense dice based on your defense characteristic. 
If you've got a shield, you then get to roll another dice. And that's either a 7, 8 or 9 up, depending on the size of the shield, I believe. So that, for the moment, is the basics of how a unit profile works. We'll talk a bit more now about abilities and equipment. By giving your units abilities, it allows you to customise your warriors and commanders further. Abilities are either triggered as an action, in which case you would place down the ability token to say that you've triggered their ability, or they are passive, and they are, in effect, always active. There are some restrictions on abilities, um, and these are, can, can feel quite technical. So you can only give abilities to as many groups as you have commanders, plus three. So if you have one commander, you'll be able to give abilities to four groups. One with the extra three, four groups. If you have two commanders, that would be five. You can purchase extra abilities equal to the number of actions a group has. So for example, if you have a group of spearmen, they can purchase one extra ability because they have one action. That applies across the board for the majority of units because most of them only have one action. That is an additional ability as well. Don't forget they may already have some inherent, inherent abilities which are essentially baked into their profile already. So they could have more than one ability if one ability is an inherent one that they get as standard. Next up, when you give an ability to a commander, that ability only applies to the commander. So this is a slight difference from groups in which if you give a warrior an um, ability, that ability applies to all the warriors within the group and you pay the points for all of them. For a commander, only the commander gets that ability. So if it's an ability which impacts, um, for example, their um, any of their statistics, like um, their attack or their defense, then you should really be rolling a different colored dice. So you can denote which is your leader and which is a regular guy. The same happens really in general combat because your leader may have a better combat ability than the rest of the group. As I mentioned, some abilities are included in the warrior's profile. So for example, spearmen, at a certain level, get access to the brace ability. This cannot be purchased for other groups that do not already have that ability. So for example, sergeants get martial respect. That cannot be purchased by spearmen. You can't cross between one profile and the other to use inherent abilities that are part of the profile. A good example of inherent abilities is for a bowman. They get access at a certain level to something called Every Bloody Sunday. And that can only be used by bowmen. It cannot be shared to a, a sergeant or a bowman. It relates to them being able to move and shoot their bows depending on the distance. Now what I'd like to talk about is command groups. So moving all this stuff back out of the way. When you are building your retinue, as I said previously, you must have one commander. That commander must be your leader. You can have more than one commander, if you so want, and you can spend up to half of your total points value on these commander groups. There's two types of commanders. There's the knight commander, or there is the veteran sergeant. The knight commander can either be a lord or a baron. A, and from memory, a baron is better than a lord. So the lord is the cheaper option, but the baron has more actions. So knight commanders can join any group except for levy troops. So for example, you could have a knight commander adjoined to a group of sergeants. This is why you would end up having to roll a different color dice for your commander because he is different you would have different statistics to these guys. Veteran sergeants can lead any group except for knights. So for example, you could not have veteran sergeant joining a group of knights. Essentially, it's trying to sort of like simulate the fact that a knight would not listen to a sergeant. He would not take orders from him. And a lord would not sully themselves by joining in with the levy. 
A commander's group always acts together, but as I said previously, in a fight or defense, you'll want to end up rolling in different colored dice because they'll have a different statistic. This does lead a question which I cannot remember the answer to, but if you are defending against range attacks, and for example, you're, you're on your commander in the black dice and everyone else in the red, and you say you fail on your commander, I believe that would cause a wound on the commander. So you potentially can lose your commander because you're rolling dice together and differentiating for the commander. It is what it is. Look after your commander, I think, is the moral of the story. So commanders benefit from being able to carry out multiple actions in a single turn. If they carry out multiple actions themselves, they do not generally become weary. So you could have a commander move and attack, or you could have a commander move and then do what's called issuing a command. Issuing a command will cost an action, and it has to be done basically measured to the nearest model in the group you want to command. They have to be within the command range. The command range as standard is six inches, but you can upgrade that if you want to equip a pennant or a banner. It essentially gives you a longer command range, making your commander far more effective on the battlefield. If they are within range, the group being ordered must pass a morale check. So say there's a spearman with a, well, I don't know, Say they're green spearmen, and they've got a six up in morale. You have to roll a dice. And if they pass the morale check, they can then carry out the action. So when a commander commands a unit, they can either command them to move if they want. They could command them to attack if they wanted. They can command them to defend or they can command them to rally, which doesn't have a token. But basically, that's that's how you bring a group back from being broken. It you bring them back into your control. If a group has already activated in this turn, say, for example, they'd already moved, and then the commander orders them to take a defense action, shields up, take a defense action, they would become weary. So they'd add a weary token as well. To finish off talking about command groups, as I mentioned, your commander can join a group. So my normal is a commander with three knights. What you can do is you can upgrade these guys so that they have additional uses. So as we've already mentioned, you can upgrade to include a banner. It is an upgrade, it is not an additional model. So you remove one knight and replace with the banner. I also like to include a musician and a priest. Each of these confer a different benefit on the commander and they affect the morale and how morale checks. Morale is tested with the groups around them. So it is very useful. It costs a few points, but it gives you a little bit of extra flexibility and a little bit of extra use with your commander. So I hope I've covered everything. I definitely recommend looking at the rule book, going through some of the unit profiles, having a look at how they work and how you build a unit. As I mentioned, that article on Warhost explains some of the things in the rule book which may seem a bit quirky. Essentially, when you're looking at a unit, it has already has a equip some equipment equipped so for example a knight already has a sword so if you want to change that to a different weapon it may have a negative points value that is because that is the difference between having a sword and having that other weapon if you're using the online army builder retinue builder you remove the sword and add the other weapon to get the true points points cost the best way i think to do it would be to look into the book itself and have a look on page 24. 
here they list all of the equipment that you can give. It gives you the modifier, it gives you the effect. So from here you'll have an idea of what you can take off and what you can give. The only thing it doesn't do is give you the points value, which is a bit of a bummer. But either way, I wouldn't worry about it too much and just have a go at writing a list, seeing what you think works and enjoy it. So thank you for watching. I hope this video has been useful as well. Um, next time, what I'd like to do is look at how a round of the game works. Going through each of the phases of the game, initiative, compulsory actions, new actions, housekeeping. And ideally, in that, what I'd like to do is be able to set this up for you with a little bit more of an example of exactly how you would play through a turn of Baron's War. Thanks for watching, and please subscribe, share, and all that, Lark. And I'll speak to you soon. Bye.